Well, good evening. This is Espresso Faith Bible Study, and we uh, thank you all for joining us, for being with us tonight. As you know, uh, typically on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we get together to study the Word. We have been gleaning from the life of Jesus. We have been studying the Gospels um, over the past, over a year almost two years that we have been studying the word. Um, please know that you can always join us uh, live or we have replay. We, we record and upload all of our studies on our YouTube channel, which is simply called Espresso Faith. If you put that into the search field, you will be able to find us. Also, if you have questions or concerns or feedback or prayer requests, anything that we can do to be of service to you. Please don't hesitate to send us an email on our uh, email account, which is www.espressofaith, all one word, at gmail.com. So we were happy to be, be happy to join our faith with you um, and, again, to be of service to you. So we're excited for the study tonight, so we're going to go ahead and get right into our time of prayer and get into the Word and see what the Lord has for us this evening. So I'll pass over uh, this time to Dad Stanley for opening prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. This is the day you've made. We rejoice. We're glad about it. And so it is you, the person of the word Elohim, God, that was made flesh to dwell among us, to exemplify the righteousness of God, the purposes of God, the plan of God, which is to have us to walk in love and to exhibit his love for his children, Lord Jesus. We are grateful, Father God, as we continue to share in your word, we become more and more like you. Your word becomes a part of who we are. We do produce trees and fruits of righteousness and of life. And, Father, we're just so thankful, Father, that as we continue to dwell in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we you, Father God, to grasp what you are giving us in the word of God. Revelation knowledge does come to us. Father, our hearts are prepared and open to receive greater and greater revelation knowledge, transforming us, the inner man, Father God, causing us to be more and more like Jesus. This is our desire. This is our effort because there's perfect peace in Christ. There is a righteousness, hallelujah, that makes us acceptable among the congregation of the righteous, among those who are holy, and we join our voices and we join our efforts and we join our intents with the centrality of those angels that give you glory, that please you well. And, Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that there's not one thing you deny us, that you are the great high priest. You intercede for us. You secure and aid and help us, Father God, in times of difficulties and non-accommodation in times of temptation. You aid us. You secure us. You make a way for our escape. You're not just a high priest who deals with us after sin, but you're a high priest who helps us avoid sin. You're the one who comes by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and blood. You're the one who does, and it demonstrates to us how we should do. We should do what we see the Father do. We should say what we hear the Father say. We should be led by this anointing that abides on the inside of us. It makes the difference. It is the teacher. It is the validator. It is the confirmer of all those things that have to do with life and godliness. And so, Father, as we join our faith together, as we continue to make ourselves available, Lord Jesus, to hear from that anointing that teaches us of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught us we should abide in you, it is the Holy Ghost that will teach us how to walk right in the center of the will of God for our lives, how to perfect our demonstration of presenting our bodies acceptable unto you. Father, because there is now no condemnation we have in Christ Jesus, and by the shedding of his blood and the accomplished work of redemption, we have a clear conscience. We have a conscience that is guiltless. Not guilty, but guiltless. It is all under the blood. And, Father, we just thank you again for the opportunity to share around this table of the Word of God, feasting on the Word of God, delighting our souls and fatness of the Word of God. And, Lord, this is what you would have us to do. This is what you would have us to be, to be excited about those things you're sharing, sharing with us by your Spirit. We bless you. We honor you. We acknowledge you as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Dad Stanley. That was awesome. And I I was going to go right into uh, just a quick review, but I wanted to, as Dad Stanley was, was praying, I wanted to use this as an example of how to pray. And if you were to go back and just re-listen to how, how Dad Stanley prayed, a lot of times, we, you know, I hear people say, well, I don't know how to pray or what to pray. And you know, if you heard what he did, he simply prayed the word. 
And so if you ever are in a situation where you don't know what to pray, it's easy to just get out your your Bible, get out your word. Amen. Even if you're standing on one word from God and you pray that word yeah, back yeah. to God in a prayer, that is more than enough for God to hear your prayer. And so I just yeah. felt inspired to just just t- um, just mention that before we get into the study that if you don't know what to pray, the word is always good to pray the word. Amen. Okay. So um, last week, uh, we are in John chapter 5. We've been in uh, John chapter 5, well, probably just a couple weeks. And last week, we were talking about um, Jesus and his, more so his interaction or his responses to uh, his healing, him healing on the Sabbath. And we concluded that uh, he made himself of no reputation. And I wanted to uh, just highlight a few scriptures that we talked about and just drive home the point uh, that, you know, when we do whatever we do in the name of Jesus, in the name of Christ, as a representation of Christ, it is him doing the work through us. It is him speaking to us and instructing us and leading us and guiding us in what to do. Um, and we do that as the righteousness of God. We are representation of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. We are soldiers in the army of God. And God gave us, Jesus gave us a mandate before he left in his earthly ministry to do greater works. And so we have a mandate to to operate in the anointing and the power and the righteousness and the grace um, that God has already preordained for us to have. So if you uh, go to John chapter 5, starting at verse 16, I'm just going to highlight a few scriptures and then drive home the point of that no reputation, and then we can get into what uh, we'll talk about tonight. So in verse 16, Jesus is talking, and he says, and therefore, well, this is not Jesus talking, and it says, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. So, uh, and then if you go down to verse 19, then Jesus Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he see the Father do. For what what things soever he does, these also does the Son likewise. And then in verse 31 of John chapter 5, he says, um, and Siobhan mentioned this last week. I'll, I'll talk. I'll hit thirty, chapter thirty, verse thirty as well. Says, I can do of my own own. So I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And so I wanted to just drive home the point um, of what we talked about last week is that we're not doing anything in our own power. We're not doing anything because Darnisha said that she thinks that she should be doing it. Um, and, and if you are doing that, then it's dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. But I, I love that Jesus said that I work like my father did in verse 17. So my father was working on the Sabbath. I'm working too. And so, um, you know, and he said that I, I do what I see my father do, I, what I see my God do, to do. And so uh, I just want to encourage you all to hear from God, hear from Holy Ghost, and allow him to order your steps and orchestrate and instruct you about who to lay hands on, where to go, who to minister to, again, where in your daily walk, wherever you're going, to just believe God, hear from God, and obey God, and not be concerned with naysayers, and um, just be encouraged in in that way. So uh, there's a little bit more in Chapter 5 that we did not touch on, so I wanted to see if if anyone had anything. Uh Uh-huh. 
I want to yeah. add something to what you just said, and that was excellent sure. how you broke down um, just that recap of, of no reputation. But there was something else that I saw in verse 32, and this will actually um, place a reminder on us from uh, the other Gospels that we studied this in. But he says, there is, this is Jesus speaking, there is another, and that should be a capital A, that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnessed of me is true. And the part that I was highlighting around that, you want somebody, you want the Father to announce you. You know what I mean? A lot of times, going along with that of no reputation, people stepping into things and no one's announced you. It's like, who are you? You don't have anybody that you're accountable to. You're not even accountable to God enough to allow him to release you into a work, you know, with the um, signs that follow that work. And I just thought that was really interesting that he said there, there is another who testifies concerning me. We know when um, Jesus was getting baptized by John the Baptist, you know, the heavens parted, boom, you, you know what the Father said, this is my son, uh, you know, my beloved son, and hear ye him. You know, he was announcing him. It was like his inauguration. And here, again, coupled with of having no reputation of doing the will of the Father, here he's also saying he bears witness of me. I have someone who is, whose weight is higher, whose opinion is higher, who bears witness that I am the truth and I am valid. And I thought that was good. Excellent. Amen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have anything else that they want to pull out of Chapter 5? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we oh, beat that man up clear. around the pool of Bethesda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna shift to yeah we're gonna shift to John chapter six and um, again an interesting thing that we talked about last week is is uh, it ties into that of no reputation again but um, you know what did Jesus do opening up in verse you know in John chapter six verse one he he um, went over to the Sea of Galilee. And he was basically trying to get away from the masses. If you see, if you open up in verse, you know, the first few verses of chapter six. And um, actually, it looks like, you know, based on how it was written, that it was an opportunity to also, you know, minister and be with the disciples based on how, uh, if you look at verse chapter, I mean, verse mm -hmm. three. So, um, and then he's, you know, probably just looking at the, the disciples, and then he looks up, and we pick up at verse 5, and it says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, and say unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? So we open up that there's another issue <laughs> that is that is going on in this passage of Scripture. and um we, we move down. I don't want to get too far if someone has anything to talk about before, before verse 9, I, I and think, we talk about another miracle. I, but, yeah, go ahead, Mama. I, I you got something? One thing I saw I wanted to point out that in the first verse, it talked about um, the lake of uh, Tiberias, T-I-B-E-R-I-A-S, um, it also lets you know that it's also known as Lake of Galilee. So I thought uh -huh. that was interesting that it pointed it out also in that same verse that it has two names that it is known by. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. What it means, that's a good thing. That's a good point. Um, but I just noticed that it pointed out that it had two names to it. I wonder why it did that. Mm -hmm. See, it's a good question. Maybe possible. we can circle back around on that next week. But I, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Why did Why did they bring that out? I mean, it it, it wouldn't have mattered. We wouldn't have known, you know, whether it was Galilee or the other one. We mm -hmm. just would have known that's the name of it and keep on moving. But 
it pointed it out, and I'm not sure why. Is it that it's going to mention it somewhere down the line, that it was going to be a part of something, or what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we know that, um, yeah, there are no words wasted. So there had to be a reason why it was reiterated in that way and pointed out I that know way. That, I know that that, that that lake of Galilee is right near the largest Jewish city. So if that had any bearing, that, that might be it. But I thought that was interesting that they considered that lake also the Lake of Galilee, which is near the largest Jewish city. They, they usually refer to it as the sea, and, and, I, and it's odd because then they call uh, Tiberias or a lake, which is odd. They call it the Sea of Galilee, but then they call it the Lake of Tiberias. So I'm not yeah. really certain what that's about. We could definitely research it. I, I don't know. But Maybe they did say it is called the, uh, the Sea of Tiberias also. They did say that um, is. They the interchanged the word. Too. Yeah, okay. I sure did. Yeah, I don't know enough about that. Yeah, I mean, King James says Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was written in the King James. And, and, and yeah. they were saying that it's near the largest Jewish city. So whatever that means, mm-hmm. it's interesting that they pointed that out in the scriptures. Um, not to take... Um, the turn away from what mom is talking about, I'm looking at the fact that I love the way Jesus just prioritized um, spending time with the disciples. Like Mm -hmm. you have a great multitude that's following you, verse 2. And verse 3, Jesus made a point to go up into the mountain and sit with with his disciples. And, I mean, when I saw and there he sat, there was intimacy that I saw in that phrasing in that scripture. So he's, he's teaching them. He's imparting to them. He's shaping them. And you know that's true because you go down a little bit further and boom, verse 6, it's like after I taught you something, after you done seen me doing X, Y, and Z, he proved Philip. He asked him a question and it was a proving time for him. You know, so he did acknowledge the multitude by saying, you know, okay, I see him. He's moved with mm-hmm. compassion. He knows they're, they're hungry. They've been traveling alongside them. He's like, okay. And then he took the time to test or prove Philip. And so I just, again, just looking at that, how Jesus flowed his, and his, he, you know, sometimes you see a lot of people with a whole bunch of followers. I know it's a huge social media <laughs> uh, era mm-hmm. we're living in, and people can have lots and lots of followers, but I how know. Jesus knew who, can you guys hear me? Can you yeah, hear me? I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. My phone starts clowning. Uh, okay, so the point that I was making is that, you know, we're in a social media era where people put so much emphasis on how many people are following. You can get up to, like, millions on Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, and it doesn't matter. Jesus knew who his were. He knew to be intimate with his disciples. you understand what I'm saying? And I just liked the I way do. there was a distinction that was made. And then he took the time to prove Philip. I mean, he still, like, he, there was, a, like, a little orchestrated, like, I see the multitude, compassion. I'm going to, you know, supply a need here. I'm going to satisfy, however, I'm still teaching at the same time. He's a master teacher. Yeah, and it's interesting, uh, you know, we have, you wear many hats, if I can say it that mm. way. And mm. I think what's powerful is that, he didn't um, want, which is, I think, is amazing about Jesus, is that one didn't sacrifice for another. Mm-hmm. And so he was able to manage ministry. He was able to manage teaching. He was able to manage, you know, healing. He was able to manage leadership and, you know, demonstrating mentorship. And so I think it's powerful that we can see all those aspects of, of Jesus um, in his earthly ministry, for sure. And yeah. so, if you look look at um, Siobhan, you you hinted on it, but I, um, if you look at verse five, it says, "When Jesus uh, then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, 
Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Mm-hmm. No, so how did how did he know they was hungry? Because <laughs> hungry got a look to it. <laughs> I mean, nobody was like, "We hungry, Jesus." I just I just think that was when you said that he knew that they was hungry. It's not implied there anywhere. Yeah, he knew it. Yeah. The scripture is saying that he knew it. Well, he knew. Yeah, but you can't never gather that many people together and not expect somebody to be hungry. It's like a family reunion. <laughs> no, you ain't say it's family reunion. Somebody yeah. going to be hungry. I did say that. I did say that. They come a long way, honey. They sure need some food. Somebody's gonna be hungry. Oh, that's hilarious. So, so as Siobhan was saying, he is he's proving Philip at this time, and he's asking him, um, you know, about how much how much money would how we gonna feed these people, um. And, of course, he says in verse 7, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. And we've talked about this in um, our previous Gospels that we talked about, um, that we've studied. Um, But you pick up at verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said unto him, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then why mention it? And, huh? Sorry. Why why mention it if it wasn't yeah, yeah. If you didn't even regard it? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If you if you you don't understand what I'm saying? Like I just I don't know. Like that's just my I was when I was reading this I kinda of put in the margin. Why why mention it if in your mind you're like that's insufficient to you know what I mean, to feed the multitude. Why even mention it? Yeah. I got a dollar here. What's the dollar going to do? <laughs> the drop you know? in the bucket. <laughs> yeah, Maybe we just like answering Jesus's was like we question. got to lose the house well, he... and who got something to help? A dollar? I mean, you understand? I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but it's like I wonder why did he mention it if he was like, but what is that amongst so many? Like their attitude, in my opinion, still lacks revelation of what it is, of who Jesus was and what he was able to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we move into a miraculous demonstration of feeding mm-hmm. um, 5,000 plus, of course, men and women, and then has some extra left over. So I don't know if anyone wants to touch on that miracle. We've talked about it in previous, um, previous Gospels, but if there's something different or di- the distinction that we want to make in John chapter 6. I do. Sherry or anybody else have something different than um, just – about the um, miracle with the uh, loaves and the fishes? Well, this might be uh, a little academic or a little obvious or literal, but, you know, in my reading of the Gospels over the decades, and uh, I would always mix up Jesus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, the account of Jesus being uh, on the water, crossing over to this other to the other side, and say to the other side, I would mix up the accounts um, with him being in the water and miracles being worked. And what I mean by that is, uh, for example, in Matthew eight, which also corresponds to Luke eight, which also corresponds to Mark five, and as we've been studying it. I've been learning how to read this as one book, the four Gospels. And all of those talk about a time when Jesus was passing over to the other side and he fell asleep and it was stormy and he said, peace be still. And then he gets to the other side and he casts out the devil. And what's interesting to me is that in Matthew 8, it indicates that there were two persons possessed with demons. And um, in Mark 6, and then in Mark 14 and in Luke 9, there's this situation where he's, um, I believe he's actually got news concerning John the Baptist's death, and he's getting kind of alone in a way, uh, wanting to be to himself, but then people start following him. And so then Mark 6 talks about 
the conversion of two fish and five loaves of bread and feeding masses. Matthew 14 talks about the same event. And then Luke 9 talks about the same event. And then after he, and, and then, so I'm talking about Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John doesn't get into this feeding of, of thousands of people until the sixth chapter. And again, after he feeds these people, then there's this walk on the water. There's a situation after he feeds them. He goes off to the mountains by himself. He sends his disciples again to another side, to the other side. But here comes Jesus walking in water. And, you know, I just think that it's good to know to distinguish those times of him going to the other side um, relative to uh, him casting out devils on one time when he came ashore uh, with regards to him working the miracle of feeding thousands another time, and then he ends up walking on water, and they think he's a ghost, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's just a a little academic point, but it's good if we would identify those times when he was in the water or on the boat, calming the sea, versus feeding people back in the water, walking on water, and even, for that matter, bidding Peter to come to him. Sometimes people get that mixed up. And, again, it's just academic, Mm -hmm. but the only place you find that written where he bed Peter was Matthew 14, where that was after he fed the 5,000 with the two fish and five loaves. So, again, just an academic point. And we know that St. John or John's gospel is very different, but he doesn't really get into this, this miracle things. or I, I, I call it catch up. He catches up with the other gospels and begins to say just a few things similar to them at, at chapter mm-hmm. 6. You know what, Dad? You're right because that was the point that I was going to bring out in verse 10. It says, and Jesus said, make the men sit down now was the next word. Now there was much grass in the place. And so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And so the part that I was looking at was um, in the account that we studied previously in Matthew 14, um, starting in verse 13, and then Mark 6, starting in verse 31, both of those accounts go into greater detail that Jesus was in a desert place. And I'm going to, not to take my word for it, I will read it. It says, Mark 6, verse 31, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and um, they had no leisure so much as to eat. And verse 32, it says, And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. In Matthew 14, Verse 13, it says, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. They were following after him. But I made a point to look at how they were in the desert. Jesus went up into the mountain and sat with his disciples. The people were in a desert place. And in verse 10, the miracle before he broke them loaves and fish up was the fact that all of a sudden it was grass in a desert place. And so when, you know, the word of God talks about he'll cause you to lay down in green pasture, that's real. Here's the reality. If you got a whole multitude of people and they're waiting on Jesus, they don't know when he's coming back down that mountainside from his disciples, why are you standing? Jesus said, make the men sit down. You would sit down if there was grass or someplace you could sit down. There was a miracle to cause um, vegetation or grass in a desert place. That's the first miracle. My, my. That's powerful. That's powerful. The, I've the never, ever, powerful ever part, seen that. The, the other powerful part is the, is yeah. the um, miracle of, the, of breaking of the bread and fish. you right. From mm-hmm. this lad had for 5,000 people. That's the other miracle. And that's just mm-hmm. the men. We're not talking about women and children, too, Ma. Or is that Miss Deborah? Uh, no. I think that's my mother. That's that's your mom. <laughs> that's my job. Yeah. I'm in the light. Um, yeah, you And like you can mine. see in verse. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Siobhan. Go ahead. No, I'm just thinking about what my sister said about, you know, it's like a family reunion. Come with some bad food at the family reunion if you want to. You know that somebody <laughs> would have been talking negatively about that fish and loaves that it had been like, you know, some old gargamel bread, some old, you know, the fish was cold or not good. 
No, the other miracle was that <laughs> the, he was able to mu- quantumly multiply and keep the taste and the flavor and everything else intact during that miracle. And and it was, in verse 13, remained, uh, there was leftovers that remained, and the words I circled in my Bible were over and above. Because that's know, what God um, is. You know, my uh, my grandmother... And my mother used to always say when we were cooking and we had uh, guests over, make make more than enough. You always want to make more than enough. Mm. You don't want to make yeah. under that. And um, mm. I look at this part here where the Lord had more than enough left over. So he we went to one of the family gatherings and they had under enough and said, oh, well. And I thought, oh. uh-oh. About to be a riot. Well, I like the part that when um, on chapter 2 of St. John, um, it says Jesus came to a wedding in Cana of Galilee or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And his wine was the best. After all, yes. that was done, I understand, fill the water mm-hmm. pot, you want to do what he tells you to do. So I bet you that the, that fish and that, um, them loaves, how he fix that stuff up, I bet that was some good eating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I bet it was. I know it was. You know what? I don't know if it's this one. Mm. I don't know if it's John's account or if it's one of the other gospels. Um, but mm, weren't they like? I want to say it's one of the other gospels where the disciples were kind of like. You know, they were they were kind of like boy wonder. What, 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 do, what do we do? What do we do? What are we going to do? Like, all these people you say, say they're hungry. What do we do? You know, send them away, Lord. Send them away. We ain't got the food. And it just, it just baffles me how, like, you're walking with the miracle maker. Like, you ain't, they still ain't got it to the head that, like, he can speak and call for what's needed. And they just, they just. It was like walking, they was the walking skeptics all the time. Not the walking dead, the walking skeptics. Like, what we going to do? What we going to do? What we going to do? <laughs> but he what? kept them close and he kept training them. Yeah, he did. Right? He, did. He, 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 he didn't throw them away. And, that, I mean, that would preach all by itself. But he, he was absolutely patient with the disciples and um, just kept developing them, just kept developing them. And we see in verse 11 that he gave thanks. And, I, I, I mean, it's, it's a few words, but I think that that is where the miracle happened, <laughs> was in the, you know, giving God thanks before, before he distributed uh, to the disciples. So I couldn't really decipher where, where the multiplication happened. It, was Jesus just like kept passing loaves, or did it just multiply in the disciples' hand and they just kept, having enough to feed everybody. It's in that it's in that's that a, verse eleven, it question. was going down. Yeah. That's the a way I question, cause, cause you got a few problems there. You got the you got the manufacturing problem, the original yes. problem from which the product comes, and then you got distribution problem. <laughs> you got dis- Come on, Dad. You know, how 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 did they, how did they distribute this? What's the supply line? You know, what what's oh, the right. Jesus? How how did you run this program? <laughs> Distribution. I don't, I don't totally comprehend this. Right, you know, I'm just wondering. The way I I'm always envision it is though, the, there was the original breaking to give it to the twelve, and then I look at it as as they went and as they broke off, it was never, it just didn't end. They kept passing out pieces, passing out pieces, it just didn't end. That's how I look at it. And they had to be big pieces because they had scraps. They had they had twelve baskets left over. Right. Yeah. That's how I, but I envisioned that as a, breaking it and passing it to somebody. It just, yeah, it more than enough. enough. In the mm-hmm. breaking. In the breaking. Um, and that the other piece that I wanted to pull out is that um, I, I think it was I think it went similar to what you're saying, Sherry, because if you notice. You know, in that from verse 11 all the way through, you know, through 13 um, and 14, you can pull that in there too, is Jesus had them doing the work. 
Yeah. Exactly. He, he, he had he, it. he, he blessed it, gave thanks, and they did it. They gathered the scraps. They they distributed, and so they they literally saw the miraculous happening in their hands. You know, this is this is gonna sound nutty. I don't I don't presume to think that everybody has seen this movie, but one of my favorite movies is The Fifth Element. And when I read Uh-oh. this, some of the other <laughs> miracles that happen, you know, the character that Chris Tucker plays is like, he's a goofy media guy, but he's also there to be witness of the miracles that this, this fifth element character, you know, is supposed to save life, um, does. And, you know, I envision him as like the disciple, you know, uh, what we gonna do? You know, we ain't got no matches to, to, to light the fire, and then all of a sudden they got a, a, a miracle. Okay. You sound just like what it. What we gonna do? What we gonna do? We gonna die? We gonna die? All of a sudden, all the little pieces being come together and see buzzing. Just like this, like I can imagine them walking around with the bread, looking at each other like, do it, do it, do it in, do it in. Eyes getting big, and then they cleaning up the scribes, and like it just marvel at each miracle. Like eyes all big. What we gonna do? What's next? Like a screen all the time. Like, it's glorious. It's a wonderful thing that's happening. Like, that's why I'm busy. Like, I have to take these stories and put it in context of what I see it and how people marvel at miracles. And I, I even see the disciples as they are marveling at what their hands are even part of uh, happening, uh, allowing the miracle to happen. Like, hey, hey, John. Looking over at each other like, yours ended, man. Mine ain't ended. You know, like, you know, what's next? You know, they, they, they're glued to the master, to Jesus, to, 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 to what's next. The difference there is, though, the way that we have to be is we have to be glued to the word because those miracles are going to come through us. And that's, that's ah, absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Now, that's you know, good. That's good. That's what the next there. level is. We have to be glued mm-hmm. to the word because we can't be boy wonder waiting for it to drop out the sky. We got to be the ones ready for that, expecting it, and then be the ones expecting it to come through us. Use us. Hey, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. That's, that's, that's excellent. Still, Jesus is still the healer, but he's operating through us. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's right. everything that we saw in Chapter 5. I mean, I mean, Jesus just made a drove home that point of God doing it through us, and then you know we see in even in chapter six a demonstration of God doing it through Him and through the disciples, and it was nothing yeah. that they were doing in themselves. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, it's something we discussed already because you've gone through Mark, but. It's the same account in Mark 6. Um, and you may be jumping a little bit ahead in, in terms of what you're discussing in John 6, but after that um, wonderful miracle they observed and participated in, he went to a mountain and then sent them to the other side and, and you see where he walks on the water toward them. And Mark's account, the sixth chapter of Mark, let me see, the 50th verse, Mark 60 and 50, it shows how regardless of the fact that they were associated with these great feats and and miraculous manifestations by the Spirit of God, even though this was occurring and had occurred, they still did not fathom the essence of what they were involved in. The 50th verse of the 60th chapter of Mark. So here comes Jesus, and uh, let's see, it goes like this. It says, For they all saw him and were agitated, troubled, and filled with fear and dread. But immediately he talked with them and said, Take heart. I am. Stop being alarmed and afraid. So he is walking on water, okay? Mm-hmm. After he fed the people and went away to the mountain to pray and sent them away at night as the boat was gone, he's walking on water. And he went up into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, sank to rest. I'm reading from the Amplified, as, as if exhausted by its own beating. And they were astonished exceedingly beyond measure. Verse 52, this is the key. For they fail to consider or understand the teaching and meaning of the miracle of the low. In fact, their hearts had grown callous, had become dull, and had lost the power of understanding. You know, and, and that's amazing. Um, I've heard it preached 
uh, when you don't give proper consideration to what's yeah. being manifest before you, it, it sets you up for a heart that, that can doubt, a heart that won't have understanding. So <laughs> whatever God is showing us as he is showing us, or demonstrating in our lives, or, uh, deliverances, ways he's manifested deliverances in our lives, we need to remember and give proper consideration that this has been a supernatural interface. He fed my family. He took care of us. He healed us. And in this supernatural manifestation, it's going to always set us up for the next time when something needs to be done to properly consider. When we properly consider our interface with the supernatural, our interface with our king, with our, with our great high priest and the answers of prayer, when we properly give consideration, we always keep our hearts in tune for the next thing coming. And, and to add to that, I was just thinking, keeping our hearts in tune, I thought about um, how Jesus, going back to the beginning of uh, verses, was testing Philip on his uh, faith by asking him where we're we going to get the food to feed the people. That was interesting that he asked Philip that. I was just, you know, listening to you guys, and I read past, and I went back, and I said, wait a minute. Jesus asked him that? Wow. He tested his faith. Where are we going to get? He, 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 he kind of was caught off guard there. Yeah, yeah. They, he was trying to see where they were at with the, um, with the training in <laughs> yeah. development. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. We got it. It's going to cost thousands of dollars, you know, so he kind of caught him off his faith walk. In other words, he didn't have faith that they could feed that many people. I thought that was so the that Jesus asked him that. Yeah. You know, our pastor said something uh, two Sundays ago about the longer – he made it personal, actually, and I, I actually thought this was interesting, but it applies very much to the disciple situation. The longer I follow Jesus, the less I am like him. The longer I follow Jesus, the harder it is to tell that I am like him. And the way he was going with it is the disciples got this – the closest folks to Jesus got too comfortable with him, got too casual with him. Spirit of familiarity. Spirit of familiarity. And instead of thanking God for the blessings and having an expecting heart um, and being thankful, they started to get critical instead. And, you know, that critical spirit, um, I'm going to just start with, it starts with like being analytical. And you're examining the situation instead of just being thankful for it. And then you go from being examining it to being critical where you, you know, you're analytical, you're losing heart. Then you get hurt, shift to critical. The more you keep being, you know, the analytical can turn to critical when you become too comfortable with the leadership, with, with Jesus, the disciples of Jesus. That critical spirit makes you to lose honor. You, you dishonor you know, what you have, who you, who you have before you. And then right. it turns right. to betrayal. And that's exactly yeah. what you did. Hello, somebody. You told, and it turned to betrayal. And so when you when you, you put that cascade together, it's like, ooh, be careful with analyzing, what, you know, overanalyzing what's happening in church and why that's just up there all the time or why she always did or da-da-da-da-da or, they could turn the music down or they could do this. Like, be careful with that. Be careful with those murmurs and complaining because what is happening is at the end of the day, you start to be, you, you, you turn from analytical where you're losing art to critical where you start to lose honor and respect to someone why he got that suit on like that. He ain't had to do all of that. And so okay. betrayal where you lose yeah. hope. And that's where Judas fell in. He fell in. And, and you know, you can see examples of this with, the woman who came in and anointed um, Jesus' feet with that alabaster oil from the alabaster box. I mean, what happened to thank God for the miracle this woman down here washing his feet? Y'all sit up here being critical. How much, how much, he could have took that money? I mean, give me a break. And then, you know, Judas, you, you're forgetting the miracle. We in the house of a dude, dude that was dead, that rose from the dead, he, and was sitting there with a, a former leper, Simon. You know, they just... They just completely missed it. And so you got to be careful with that complacency, that getting too familiar with the leadership, you know, 
because then it just it shifts to something that you don't even you don't even look like Jesus no more. Uh oh, man! Mm-hmm. Before you know, you know it, you... I, I will piggy, mm-hmm. I'll piggyback on that. Right, go ahead, Dad. I, I don't think I don't think being analytical is the problem. I uh, I, I hear how you you know how you put that little scheme together, but the issue is motivation. Your your motivation as you as you analyze. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. God wants to be understood. And the bottom line is you're not going to rationalize yourself into a completeness, a complete awareness of God. He's going to reveal himself to you. But in the meantime, you, you want to be curious. You want to understand, you know, some of the tenets of the Bible, some of the things that, that are said that maybe nobody's explained yet. You know, we're supposed to be curious, and we're supposed to be analytical. But the issue is what's the ultimate motivation behind your analysis? You're trying to disprove them. You're trying to disprove. And so, um, you know, and something I realized some decades ago, I wrote a paper when I was in college, and uh, it, well, it, it, it's something to do with, well, it's something to do with knowledge. You know, they tell you that that knowledge, you know, what man understands about knowledge, I don't know if it's part of psychology or philosophy, but it's one of the two. And it says that when you walk into a room, there's perceptual knowledge you gain because we're built like that. You know, we only use so much of our brains, but we're built that when you walk into a room, you're going to begin to gain certain things. Yeah, you could say from your common senses, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, what you, you know. But going beyond perceptual knowledge, then there's uh, supposedly empirical knowledge. You may take some instruments, then there's the, the rational logic where you take what you gain from, from your common senses and from your empirical instruments and you come up with some rationalizations. You will never assent to comprehend the totality of God. He's going to have to reveal himself to you. And, and again, you know, being analytical is not the issue. The issue is what's your motivation behind it? Are you trying to disprove the supernatural? Are you trying to disprove that there's God? But... You know, even in philosophy, there's this term, and I think I mentioned it before. It's 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 expressed. It's, the, the expression is a priori, a priori, and I think it's O P slash P I O R I C something like that. And what it does is it, it really is equated with revelation. You know, you can do all you want to smell, to taste, to, to under a microscope. You know, to, to dropping it 15 times, to putting it, you know, in a in a, in a in a in an environment where it's isolated and there's a vacuum and you're studying this phenomenon, but there is revelation that has to come. There's a realization that has to come. And like, you know, you remember you said before, George Washington said at some point, and I'm going to say it like this with the Bible, it says if your heart is right, you know, it's over in Second Peter, it says, Second Peter, first chapter, it says if your heart is right, if you add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, patience, temperance, and godliness, brotherly kindness, if these things be in you and abound, again, if your heart is right, you will never be ignorant or barren of the knowledge, of epignosis, of revelation knowledge. So, again, being analytical to me is not the issue. I mean, God will give you a way to present something, some truth of his, to help it be more palatable to somebody who does not understand. And so you want to have revelation knowledge. You want to be analytical. You want to be open and available. But the issue is going to always be, what is your motivation? Is your motivation to disprove, you know, God, or is your motivation to understand him, to believe him more? I'm glad you said that at the end. That, oh, I'm sure. I'm sorry. So I was going to say, maybe I kind of inferred that by my examples, but yes, it is the motivation behind what you're analyzing. Like, if you take specifically like that yep. instance with the Alabama spot, you know, it was the motivation behind her analysis. It wasn't just that, you know, she was breaking it and she's wiping his feet and, and stuff. It was that, you know, their motive, their motive behind it. So I may have just inferred that, but I'm glad, I'm glad you explicitly stated it, yeah. Amen. Right. So I was going to say heart, and that you 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 drove that point home is just is the, the condition of the heart. Because I have, I mean, when I was a babe in Christ and I was a new Christian, I had a lot of questions and I had a whole lot of opposing opinions coming at me, and I had sincere questions that I I just didn't understand. But again, God knew my heart to ask those questions because I, I just needed more understanding. And so um, before we wrap up, I wanted to, to uh, touch on verse 15, because we saw in the previous scriptures where Jesus sat down with the disciples and he was teaching and then all these people came and he fed them. And we see what happens here before we close in verse 15. It says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, to make him a king, he it's a whole bunch there, but I wanted to drive home the point that he departed again into a mountain 
himself alone. Mm -hmm. And so we see in this passage of scripture that he had to get away from everybody. And uh, I was actually listening to a word from a pastor, uh, actually it was last, last year, early last year that he preached it, and he was saying how he he's intentional with taking sabbatical and, you know, was saying that if you, you know, if his parishioners don't allow him to take time to refresh, not because there's drama or issue, but just to refresh by himself and with his family, then it's, what's the point? And so we see that there are times where Jesus will take time to teach, instruct, minister to the to to the people, do the miraculous, and also times where he just had to go and be by himself yeah. to re, to refresh. Yeah. And so yeah. it it's it's important for all of us to do that, but it's also you know important for for us um, with praying for our leadership and our pastors and you know those that are in positions of authority that we, you know, allow them to rest and not be mad because somebody else is in the pool pit because pastor had to take time away. <laughs> Come on, and we just see it demonstrated here with Jesus that there were times where he went by himself to just be alone and refresh. Amen. Amen. That's Amen. a good word. Right in that. Amen. Amen. So, um, Absolutely, absolutely, and and Dad, you want to repeat that? You said if he can use a donkey. I said if, if God can use a donkey, he got some else in congregation. He can use our pastor dog. Oh okay. Lord! <laughs> yeah, feast is yeah. being prepared. The word. Yeah. Yeah. Mhm. Yep. 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 So um, yeah, this was. Excellent tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Siobhan close. We're running a little bit behind, and then yeah. I'll just uh, close us up after you pray. Okay. No mm-hmm. problem. I got all prayer requests, and I just um, – we just worship, praise, and adore you, Lord. We thank you for yet another outstanding Bible study, Father. We love your word. We honor you. Uh, we revere you as the bread of life, the manna that came down from heaven, and we place you in uh, just the proper uh, respect. You are paramount. You, your word is the final authority in our life, and we uh, we esteem and love you. Lord, we just thank you that we have the liberty and the, to be able to um, just minister your word back to you and to one another, Father. And we just thank you for this time to even just lift these prayer requests up to you with full expectation that an answer is already being released, that these individuals are already walking in wholeness and restoration. Even as we're praying right now, we send a word to Mr. Sherman Slade. And we say, Father God, that you will regulate his um, weight. You will uh, cause healing to bubble up in his body, Lord. And I just thank you that you have the right um, attendees to be able to pinpoint exactly what's going on so that the right care can be administered in the name of Jesus. But we stand as a hedge of protection round about him. And I thank you, Father God, that restoration is being applied to his life even as we're praying. Father, we just... um, continue as a Bible study, as a family, as a people of God, to spit on cancer. This disease is completely beneath our feet. We say, Father God, that uh, it's a hold and um, just the the tentacles that come off, off cancer and all the root system that come along with cancer, that stuff is severed and broken, Father, in the life of Natalia. Her young life, Father God, we lift up to you. We rebuke cancer. We rebuke um, cancer off of um Miss Deborah's girlfriend's husband who's been diagnosed with stage four cancer. Father, none of these situations are difficult for you. None of it's impossible for you. It's already finished and done. And so we speak and stand against cancer, even in Miss Deborah's body. And we command that a, a report that's aligned with the word of God comes forth in the name of Jesus. We apply the word in every one of these situations, and we don't turn away from it. Lord, I just uh, lift up Sister Walita, Sister Singletary, Father, I just thank you that you are restoring health to their body, healing any wounds 
And, Father, I just thank you that there is much more that you'll have them to do. Even where they're at, Father, they're alike. They're the inside uh, man on the job, Lord. And I thank you that you are ministering health to them and everyone that that comes into contact with them, that you all prosper them in every single area. Bless Glory, them Lord. and the lives of their families in the name of Jesus. Lord, we lift up Miss Dorothy and Miss Bertha. I thank you, Father, that um, Miss Bertha will allow Miss Dorothy to help her, Lord. I just take authority against this blindness, yes. Father, that her eyes be open, that she doesn't see partially, but full restoration in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that Miss Dorothy leans on the helper in order to extend help out, Lord. And I say that she trusts you, Lord, and lean not on her own understanding about things, but she speaks the word only and that you'll use her mightily. Father, I just thank you that we always give you proper consideration in our lives, that you open doors of opportunity and favor. Enlarge us and those who have been connected to this Bible study. Add a blessing to their lives in the name of Jesus. We are carriers of peace in your anointing in our workplaces, amongst our unsaved loved ones, amongst, Father God, our community and within our churches. I just thank you that Father, just the power of God just continues to touch our um, places of worship, Father, that you come on in and visit, Father. Come on in and dwell, Father. Inhabit these places, Father. Touch our pastors, Father, and our leadership, Lord, that they continue to have a heart for you, oh God. Lord, I thank you for that refreshing for them, even as Darnisha was mentioning that tonight, just a refreshing that they not get burnt out from the things that you called them to do, but a refreshing and that the people of God God, who are assigned to them, will continue to hold their arms up and speak right in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, tonight, I just thank you, there's anyone that's connecting and hearing us, that they'll know that the word is close, that the word is my them, that it's in their mouth and in their heart. This message concerning faith, what we're proclaiming tonight. And I thank you, Lord, they'll believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead and that they shall be saved. It is unto salvation that we're speaking tonight in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Father God, that this word just resonates with us all through this week. This is an incredible, unprecedented, uncommon kind of week where blessings are breaking off from areas that are unexpected. And I thank you that we'll hear about it because that's the kind of God you are. We've been studying the God that's over and above beyond anything we could dare to ask or think. And I thank you, Lord, that you're exceeding our expectation, that you're blessing your people, Lord, that you're drawing us us close, sitting down with us, being intimate exchange with us. And I thank you, Lord, that we're not just hearers only, but we're doers of the word of God, doers of the will of God. And I thank you, Father God, for that boldness, for that courageousness, that we continue to minister with efficacy in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Father God, for this time that we set apart to just honor you and worship you and minister unto you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Amen. We receive it by faith. When you want to seal a prayer, you say amen and amen. So I say amen, amen, I receive everything that Siobhan prayed by faith, and this is an amazing week for each and every one of you listening, every moderator, we're in expectation of the manifestation of the power of God in our lives, and so we thank, thank you all for listening, we call you blessed, if you just receive that prayer by faith, we, we just want to hear the testimony. We want to hear the testimony. We we will share it next week. So we just call you blessed and empowered to prosper and everywhere that you uh, step foot, that the Father is with you and will orchestrate and ordain your speech, your talk, your touch. Everything is ordained by him. And uh, if you need anything from us, again, you can email us at www.espressofaith. Wait, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. www.espressofaith.com. Espresso faith at gmail.com. 
And, of course, you can listen to us, any other replay of our messages on our YouTube channel. Just type in Espresso Faith in the search box and you'll find us. We thank you for listening and just uh, continue to believe God, walk in faith, walk in the truth of God's word, and he'll do everything else. In Jesus' name, have a good, excellent night and week. Amen. Amen. Good night. Love you, darling.